So, Mike, once again, huge congratulations on winning your award. Now, Thank you. Book awards are a bit like buses from town, none for ages, and then suddenly two come along in a row. Obviously, you won the Goldsmiths Prize very recently, and then here you are tonight with the Eason Book Club Novel of the Year. What kind of affirmation does this give to you about this book? It affirms what my publishers thought of the book when they picked it up. Uh, they read it, and they spoke to me about it, and they told me that it worked and that it was a book that they had complete faith in and that they they said that there is an audience out there for this book. I said, it's an awkward proposition. It's uh, a middle-aged man, a happy middle-aged man, and uh, it's a continuous outpour of a book. Do you really think that there are people out there who will go for it? And they said, yes. They said that we have faith in readers. And so that's what it, it, um, it vindicates there vindicates their judgment completely. Well, in this room, you're sitting amongst a room full of book club readers. So thank oh, you so thank much you for adding much. to our collections. Thank you very much, book let's, club readers. Let's talk about the form of the book, because it has this form that lots of people are talking about. It's you know one long sentence as such. What was it about that form that drew you? Why, why give yourself that challenge? Um, the book offered it to me. Um, at a Quite early in the writing of the book, I realized that it was a ghost that was speaking. and. The more I thought about the way a ghost would speak, the more it seemed to me that a ghost would have no interest in full stops and that a ghost would actually shy away from full stops uh, and that it would be more likely to look for continuance and ongoingness. And once that idea presented itself to me, then the book picked up a running kind of systolic rhythm and um, it ran with it. And um, it was just a question of, of, uh, of finding proper transitions between the subjects and the moods uh, of, of the book after that. So it, was, it wasn't me that decided, the, it was the book that more or less decided the form for me. Marcus himself, when I found out he was a ghost, he says, this is the way it's going to be. Now, the book starts, it's very poetic, you know, the first few pages. And I was wondering, at what stage will I lose my awareness of the form of it? And then suddenly, you know, Dara Marks' son is in Australia, he's on Skype, and, you know, his daughter's doing art gallery exhibitions. And you're not afraid of being modern at all in the middle of it all. So next thing I knew, I'd forgotten all about it. It felt as real, as fresh as any other kind of fiction that one would read. Um, good. I'm, it's part of the feedback. And again, it vindicates uh, my agent and publishers is that they said people are going to find this book readable. And that seems to be the case, that uh, people have said that it's a funny sort of an experiment. It's a readable experiment. And, That's a uh, shock, isn't it? It is a shock. <laughs> Most experiments are, are fragmented and adversarial and they're difficult uh, and disorienting. But uh, this experiment seems to have the idea that life is a harmonic and that it's bound together and here's how it, here's how it can all flow together in, in one continuous riverine flow. That's Along with playing Kid uh, A from Radiohead in the background. Well, well, <laughs> well I think it was. I think it's actually is it King, Kid A and King Crimson that, that is played. That is the soundtrack to the book of all things. Now, can we talk a little bit about the labour of love that this book has been for you? Because your first few books, your publications, they got such attention a few years ago. Then you were being published by Jonathan Cape. Can you talk to us a little bit about the struggle you've had to bring this book? Um, yeah, I, I, I was, I, I was published. My first three books were published with Jonathan Cape, and they were critically well received. But they, they just kind of dropped off the edge of a cliff in terms of commercial appeal and that. And, and this when, was back in sort of 2005. 2005, yeah, 2005 was the last book, Notes from a Coma. And once that book was published, then it, it um, they sort of made it known to me that you know this dance is over. You're going to have to find some other partner for your work. We've done as much as we can with you and that. So there was, a, there was years after that in which I could not give my work away, really. And then I, a great uh, Irish publisher, Anthony Farrell, took on a book of short stories and made a beautiful, beautiful edition of my last collection of short stories called Forensic Songs. And uh, that got critical acclaim, but the, again, it fell over the side of a cliff. So there really was, it was really difficult to get anyone interested interested in me and then interested in me coming with an experimental book is uh, you know everything for you is going against you when you have when you make that kind of a proposition but you knew you'd a voice that people were interested in because the books had been so well received your problem was progressing that it was what to get the commercial faith from a publisher in you 
commercial faith and kind of a, a, a faith of commitment. Uh, and so brought the book around to publishers and again the same thing that uh, everyone says, yeah, I like it, but you know, it's McCormick, it'll get good reviews and then it won't sell. And so the book really had nowhere to go, but then we brought it to Tramp Press and I'd been familiar with their work from a previous, uh, from the, they had been interns in Lilliput when I had, uh, when I had published Forensic Songs. Ah, so, so you've known them back yeah. when they were uh, Lisa starting out, okay. Sarah wrote the first, Sarah wrote the reader's report on, on Forensic Songs. She recommended that it be published by, she okay. was part of the people that recommended it should be published by. So when they'd but, set up Tramp Press, that relationship was there, that trust was there, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, they've had a phenomenal record in just going for difficult, if you know what I mean, experimental styles of books and just doing so well with them. Yeah, they have. They've, uh, I think they're pretty fearless. And so I sent them the book and, and they, they called me up 10 days later and said, we'd like to take you out for a meal. And so I went to a, a restaurant in Galway and sat me down and they proceeded to talk about the book. And within 10 minutes, I knew that the book had found its proper home and that it had it actually had had to go around the world to find its proper home. Something about the riverine circuit of the world that it took, which was in keeping with the book itself. The book is kind of, the book is meandering and everything about the book was meandering. And here it was, it, it, it arrived by dint of, uh, of, uh, of a circuitous route. It came home to its proper place. And the, the two, they were fearless, completely fearless. They, they, they took are. it up and the, yeah, they took it up and they ran with it, and they were very, very, um, very canny, and they gathered great people towards them, and that the designer, and the typesetter, and that uh, Fierke and Marsha, and uh, they just made a beautiful looking book as well. Um, it's it's just a credit to. I think history will, history will decide how good or bad a, a, a time this is in, in terms of Irish literature, but there's no doubt but that this is a great time for Irish publishers, that they're just making gorgeous books and, they're, and uh, Trump are, are one of those, uh, Trump Press are one of those people who are making gorgeous books. Well, I hope it's not so long until you write your next one and we have you so back here I. again. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. But for now, Mike McCormick, huge congratulations with Solar Bones. Thank you very much.